here reductionistic explanation about you know certain molecular testing in you know test tubes is not enough to understand the real situation inside the body or the cell well i would say a reductionist approach is the first step in understanding the whole system see if you don't have reductionist understanding and understanding the whole system is almost impossible so although of course you see reductionist approach may not be enough as you said you know polio virus has been eliminated from the whole world of course smallpox has been eliminated polio is about to be eliminated all these achievements are really achievements of the reductionist approach that the science has followed so i wouldn't uh, demean reductionist approach so much you no, know we don't deny the you know the uh, technological benefit of reductionism but what i'm saying whether we have reduced life to molecules from that approach that question is not yet answered when you think life is reduced to the level of molecules see if every chemical reaction in the cell the thousands of reactions that take place can all be understood in terms of the physics and chemistry of the constituting molecules i would think we have understood the function of the whole cell to a large extent the difference between an inanimate matter and life is that of complexity you know the life is so much more complex there are things that can happen with life which will not happen with inanimate matter see once so it, how com is, how com how complex you know systems uh, uh, develop uh, the concept of you know the ethics or you know the influence of environment and uh, things like that uh, the, well, uh, actually analysis of complex systems is a very nascent science in the sense that it is just beginning how to analyze complex systems and what would be their outcome but to relate it to mental states very much in the future you know it, it, nobody is trying to attempt to understand mental states by analyzing complexity of the system there is an emerging field which we call systems biology this uh, tries to model not only molecules but their mutual interactions this is a field which is still in infancy it hasn't made great achievements yet but still there are efforts efforts to understand the group behavior of these molecules similarly you can actually try to understand group behavior of ants or bees that is part of ecological studies so there i think the success rate is a little bit more than in systems biology a real living cell like this parahelicea is in fact filled with amazing complexity each one of those organelles is as important as an organ within your body but it's within a single cell just imagine the complexity of what's going on within your neurons no they're not just firing off signals they are complex and autonomous and thoughtful and yet wherever you go you find people down base cells and create simplified versions simply to satisfy the fact that the public then will feel you know a lot every part of our body is sensate every part of our body has its own form of cognition and every part of our body is communicating with the rest of us a, a, a view which is very close to the um, ancient vedic treatises in um, um in india professor ford i, I am 
more aligned with your way of thinking than than I let out. I mean, I, I, I my first contact with your work was a short essay you wrote either for Scientific American or the New Scientist in 2010. The Power of the Single Cell, I think, was the, the name of Yeah, yes, New Scientist, that one was. Yeah. yeah, and you talked about an amoeba capable of building a little shell for itself using mud That's particles. It. I was just flabbergasted by that. And uh, I am more aligned with you about the, the intuition that there is a natural intuitive intelligence built into life. It may not have the, have the ability to introspect or to think conceptually or to think symbolically like we do, but it's tremendously intelligent nonetheless. It's a spontaneous natural intelligence. I, I'm aligned with you there. I, I The only thing is I, I, I live in in an environment where I cannot say anything that I cannot explicitly and unambiguously substantiate, at least in principle. And I do not have a way to do that when it comes to natural spontaneous intelligence of all life, even, even single-celled organisms. It becomes an empirical question. I'm not versed enough with it um, uh, to, to defend it that way. So I stick with the in-principle uh, 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 questions. I think what we call reductionism has gotten a bad press. Um, in principle, to reduce something to another means only to explain one thing in terms of another. That's all it means. But it has come to mean, under the materialist or physicalist ethos, to reduce a whole to fundamentally separate interacting parts. But that's not really what reductionism in and of itself means. It's a particular form of reductionism to reduce a holistic system into interacting but fundamentally separate parts. I think that is wrong. I think fundamental wholes cannot be explained in terms of the behavior of its proper parts. There may not even be a thing such as a proper part. The problem is not that reductionism is good or bad, that reductionism is all. And that, from my point of view, is an overwhelming consideration. And we really need, for instance, uh, people always want electron microscopes with higher and higher magnification. Mo most of my work is done with microscopes that magnify about 150 times, because that's where you can see entire cells talking to each other and communicating and living their little lives. I'm not bothered about what's going on inside their mitochondria. I couldn't give a stuff for what's inside the DNA of their genes. I want to know what they are doing. Another thing, a very common assumption in modern science, which is utterly unjustified and in fact contradicted by science itself, is the notion that all salient laws of nature are already at work at the microscopic level. In other words, that all laws of nature ultimately are the laws of microscopic quantum systems. That's an enormous assumption. There can be uh, uh, um, organizational principles, fundamental organizational principles in nature that only kick in at in, in larger systems, uh, that only kick in at certain levels of complexity, so to say. There are no choices in the genome. There are switches. Each gene coding part of the DNA has a structure close to it, which if activated by the rest of the cell, notice that it's the living cell that does it. If activated by the rest of the cell, enables that gene to start informing the ribosomes in the cell to produce the protein necessary for that function. But that's not something that the gene does without being activated from the high level property of the cell as a whole. I, I say I'm sorry because we've wasted 20 years when we could have been focusing at the level at which it's possible to understand health and disease. That's higher levels of the organism. And we didn't do that. We chose to spend all the money on sequencing as many genomes as possible. And we've ended up with the result that it doesn't tell us what makes us work. What makes us work as organisms is us. 
It is our cells, our tissues, our organs, and even the organism as a whole. Because remember, I put the sociotype at the top of that uh, inverted uh, uh, triangle of causation. This is a little map that I've uh, drawn for myself to show the development of, of Western uh, philosophy over this over the past couple of thousand years. And I'd like to first blow up a, 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 a an assertion that I often hear made by people, which is that science is the liberation from philosophy. Well, that's nonsense. Science is philosophy. It's just a different kind of philosophy. Like I said, Dr. Guerrero also mentioned this about how people have changed the idea of, let's say, our Aristotle or Plato over the centuries and <clears throat> come down to the, till we come down to what the modern scientific viewpoint is. But that has not always been entertained by civilization. And the civilization, we cannot assume that the past civilizations were less intelligent than ourselves. They had reasons for the things they understood. And we have to try to uh, discern that reasoning in our present day, even though things have changed so drastically. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do by study of the history of ideas and how they developed to the present stage from the past. And if that can be, can be understood, I think, and I have found that kind of resolution of the relationship between, say, religion and science in the philosophy of Hegel and the philosophers during that, uh, the German idealistic period. And of course, we find that also in Vedanta and the Vedas. They, did never, they never had a, had a problem of conflict of science and religion as we do today, because their understanding was very different than what we have now. Uh, Descartes was um, um, broad-minded enough to realize that uh, thinking about machines is not going to explain thought. Right. So he gave it, he gave thought this entirely separate domain, the thinking things as opposed to the extended things. And as a result, um, uh, he wasn't able to explain any how those two domains could interact. Uh, that's the problem of subject and object, as you, as we put it in these very abstract uh, Kantian or Hegelian terms. It's all the same permanent. Uh, unsolved issue of um, modern science. Um, and you're right that um, that is Hegel's primary, well, one of his primary concerns is to overcome that duality. Um, and uh, Dr. Puri is right, of course, um, in focusing on that. Um, how Hegel proposes to overcome that duality is a pretty complicated issue in, in his text and his Science of Logic and his Encyclopedia. If we want to be truly philosophical uh, in our understanding of things, we have to take what the philosophers have already established as essential points of consideration. And this, this idea of purpose or final end or whatever you want to call it is a central topic of philosophy since the time of Aristotle. And in a very important study that Immanuel Kant made so many thousands of years later, a couple of thousand years later, uh, is that the feature that distinguishes life from matter is called uh, nature's wick. He called it nature's wick which means a purpose, a natural purpose. The life ha has as its fundamental principle uh, a purposefulness. Uh, now, that is also called in philosophy teleology, uh, that there is an end uh, that things tend toward. Uh, 
and it is not merely a, a you know a mechanical end but it's an end that's contained in potential at the beginning the whole potential for what is to come is already contained in the beginning and then it manifests itself in the end in nature a thing appears first of all as a a seed or an undeveloped beginning and then gradually envelops develops over time this does not mean evolution development and evolution are two different things at the way i'm trying to use these words a seed develops into uh, a mature stage by the process of what we call growth it doesn't evolve from an undeveloped stage to a more developed stage. Uh, evolution is a different process. We mean by evolution as defined by Darwin, a different process in which something somehow comes uh, to be through random processes, something else. But develop means that a thing comes to be itself fully or matured through a certain process that's intrinsic uh, to the original seed or beginning stage. So this process of development from seed to maturity is not described by science. Mm -hmm. Science does not know the intricate steps in going from the unmanifest to the manifest stage of a thing. I embryological studies are there but basically the foundational principle of how a stem cell say for instance uh, uh, knows how to develop from its from its um uh what would you say uh, homogeneous state more or less <clears throat> state a highly differentiated state in the end such that the original homogeneous state of the zygote can develop in such a way that it produces very different uh, results, including hairs or fingernails, liver, eyes, uh, heart, <laughs> all these different things that come from the original egg, which are more or less how homogeneous, how it differentiates at all these different organs is not known by science. They cannot understand that process. I mean, they can see it before themselves, their uh, microscopes, uh -huh. but they cannot explain how that happens. There is no explanation. So, some will give uh, some superficial uh, statements uh, like uh, orientation or whatever they, they may come up with. However, the process is not fully understood. Yet that may, I, um, constantly. may I add a comment? Oh, please. I want to say that the points you're making are, are most germane and are central to my thinking. Um, uh, you have often said with um, uh, memorable directness that um, um, science cannot make a blade of grass. And of course, you will know that I look at it slightly differently. Um, science cannot even fully conceive of a single cell within a blade of grass. Yes, I had a, uh, a query. You may have heard of the, uh, uh, of course, molecular biologists and their cell biologists. The molecular biologists, even uh, they have to concern themselves with, uh, uh, you know, editing and replicating and all uh, types of activities that seem to require uh, intelligent uh, manipulation. Uh, it's actually amazing how, you know, what so-called chaperone molecules and other things suddenly appear just when they're needed in just the right place and how that yeah. all happens is quite unknown, uh, indicating that something beyond the molecules is operating, especially uh, Barbara McClintock. She studied that phenomenon and used to think of, of thoughtful you know, molecules, thoughtful DNA processes. I think Lynn Margulis also was very impressed by her, her work. 
And then that's one level of biologists. The other level is, of course, the cell biologists. And they operate on a very different level than the, the, the molecular biologists. But I'm wondering, have you ever heard of the organismic biologists? They, yes. uh, let me just say one thing. They, ha they mm -hmm. have their statement that uh, cells don't create plants. Plants create the cells. That's the difference between the cellular and organismic biologists. Mm. Yes, I think the organismic biologists have just got it the wrong way around. <laughs> the cells are the plants. The cells create the plants. Um, um, the mistake of the organismal train of thought is that they imagine, and this is very popular, that, that, that bodies are divided up into cells. You'll find that phrase everywhere. No, they're not divided up into cells. The cells divide themselves up to make the body. Now, molecular biologists, I may say Max Perutz, so he's the man who invented molecular biology, and he always came to my lectures, and he was fascinated by my lectures on the intelligence of single cells. I also knew Barbara McClintock, though uh, she never came to one of my, my talks. But the, um, the interest of molecular biology is that it solves so many functional problems but as I said in my talk, it's as though you're analyzing the ink on the paper and you don't realize it's a Mahler score and you should be listening to the symphony. Um, the uh, the uh, organismal biologists are, I think, barking up the wrong tree. I'm a cell biologist. I look at cells. But most people who look at cells look at bulk cells. They'll look at um, a culture of cells and they'll test them in some way and see how the cells as a whole react. I'm one of the few people along with um, Dr. Pickett Eaton, Australia, I'm one of the few people who actually look at a cell and see what that single cell does in relationship to its friends. I regard cells as, as uh, our distinguished chairman, Scott Jordan said, I regard cells as, as organisms, creatures with a mind of their own. They're not subsets or bits of anything. They, they cooperate to produce the phenomenon that we know of life. And I just wish people would humble themselves and see themselves mirrored through the single cells of which we are composed. That is what we need for the future of science. Well, I think the um, argument against the cellular conception is that if you take a cell or the certain number of cells outside of the organism, they will not necessarily produce the organism. So to That's say true. that the cells themselves are the cause of the organism sort of misses uh, the role of the organism as a whole, has uh, what effect that has on the cells. And again, this relates back to what I was talking about, the universal in particular. The whole, and, and in this case, the whole is more than just the cell. It's the combination or unity of all the cells. That there is some influence coming from that universality that is not recognized in the cell uh, bio biological picture of life and this you is you could well be right yes the problem we face of course <clears throat> is that few people have ever investigated this i admired your talk greatly although you spoke for too long you bad boy oh, but sorry. i admired your talk greatly <laughs> because you set the ground perfectly for mine the way that you spoke of robotics and all of the other things i mean really and truly um, the um, the delegates at this conference will be quite convinced that the two of us got together and we decided that uh, the two talks would link together as well as they did. I was very impressed by what you said. And yes, the point you raised is right. But these are unanswerable questions that we need to discuss. And until we begin to grasp the realities of the living cell, we can't really start to argue about their significance. But yes, you, you could well be right. Thank you. <laughs>